Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to occupy the Wayne Morris Chair of Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. I had the good fortune of meeting Wayne Morris. He's a great citizen of Oregon, a great citizen of our country. When I uh, met Wayne Morris first, he was still a Republican. <laughs> and uh, I was administrative assistant to Walter Ruther. And he's trying to convince Senator Morris to come over to the Democratic Party. He says, after all, we are philosophical soulmates and you really belong in a Democratic Party. Uh, Wayne Morris said, no, I'm going to stay in a Republican Party because I view my task and my mission to reform and enlighten the Republican Party. Of course, even a man of Morris's great persuasion and intellect and brilliance, that was a task that proved even to him impossible. <laughs> well, we meet in very difficult times, and the unemployment in our nation is 7.3%. That's 9,200,000 people. We have what we call discouraged workers, those who have given up looking for employment because they view it as futile, 1,100,000 in that category. And then we have 6,500,000 of our fellow citizens who are working part-time who want to work full-time. I'm not talking about those who are working part-time because they want to work part-time because it fits into the family plan, but those that want to work full-time. You add those all up, you're talking about 16,800,000 of our fellow citizens who are either unemployed or underemployed. And while this is going on, we're engaged in fierce international competition, and competition has been, in the last few years, sort of a buzzword. It's oftentimes used as an excuse to lower wages or freeze wages. And when people say, well, maybe part of the problem was the high wages of this country, and we talk about high wages you, and question high wages, you raise half a question. The other half of the question, what is the productivity of that group? And as you know, it's quite possible to have higher wages and lower unit labor costs if your productivity is great enough. Now, the competition should not be based upon who can pay the lowest wage. It should be based upon technology. It should be based upon your ingenuity, being innovative, uh, managerial skills to organize your workforce in a democratic manner, uh, your marketing skills, those are the items upon which competition should be based. If we're going to base competition on who can pay the lowest wage, and the only way we can compete is lower the American wages to those of Mexico or South Korea, we're in a hopeless competitive fight, and we've lost the middle class in the United States. And the answer to this dilemma is not dragging down our standard of living to those of Mexico and South Korea, but lifting up their standard of living to the level of we in the United States. Invoking the name of Walter Ruther again, I can recall this would be in the early 50s, and we were in one of the, we were in Germany as a matter of fact, just recovering from the devastation of the war. We went to an automobile plant there, and there weren't any automobiles in the parking lot, there were bicycles. And somebody made this observation, and Walter Ruther said, well, he says, if you pay bicycle wages, you have a bicycle economy. And I think there's a lesson to be learned from that. Now, there are those critics, mostly from abroad, who say American workers are lazy, the American workers lack ambition. And I can tell you the American workers don't lack ambition, they just lack jobs. And people who make these remarks either abroad or in our country, really don't understand unemployment. And maybe you can't understand unemployment unless you've experienced it or been close enough to feel it and touch it. I can tell you that a man and woman who's ready and able and anxious to work and can't find employment to support themselves and their families uh, suffers from frustration and sometimes agony and despair. And then unemployment raises tensions in our society, and perhaps it's not 
the case in this part of the country, but in many metropolitan areas of our nation, there's racial tensions that basically come about because there's not enough jobs for all the people. And you have these tensions between groups. And there's a fundamental truth, and that is you cannot divide up scarcity. You can only share in abundance. And what we need is a national policy for sustained economic growth, full employment, and price stability. We need to put much more in terms of our, all of our resources into research and development to enable us to better compete technologically with the competition we face in the world. We have to change our trade policies. We have with Japan a one-sided, lopsided, discriminatory, inequitable trade relationship. And I could stand up for the next two hours and recite the grievances that we have with Japan in our trade relationship. And I want to quickly add, I do not blame the Japanese people. It's counterproductive, I think, to criticize the Japanese people, whether they're here or in Japan. The fault lies mostly with our own government who refuses to bargain tough enough and firm enough so that the Japanese respond and open up their markets so we get some equality in our trade relationship. And this is not theoretical. I can tell you other nations do it with great success. But it's not only Japan. Let's look at the Airbus situation. Now here is the last great industry of our nation where we are, have a virtual monopoly where it's our greatest exporting industry, McDonnell Douglas and Boeing. And now arriving in the scene in the last few years is the Airbus. McDonnell Douglas's share of the market has gone from 30% to 15%. And the Airbus is arriving in greater and greater numbers. And what is the Airbus? The Airbus is a consortium, United Kingdom, Germany, France, and Spain. They invested collectively $26 billion to launch the competition against our com companies. And they've lost money for over 10 years, are now beginning to make money. Well, that is unfair competition. Boeing and McDonald cannot generate enough capital to compete with Airbus. And so what is happening now? McDonald Douglas needs an infusion of capital of $2 billion that are going to Taiwan. And what we'll do is we'll lose some of our production here and some of our technology. Boeing has to scramble. They want to build a plane, a successor plane to the 747, an even larger plane, if you can imagine. The Airbus has got one on the drawing board, so Boeing knows they have to have one. And they're going to need the capital, and they may have to go abroad. And it seems to me we should be thinking in terms of what other countries do. We can't evidently stop them from doing it. We've complained to GATT about the activity of the Airbus consortium uh, with no results at all. The issue of health care impacts greatly on our competitive position. We will this year spend roughly about 12.2 or 12.3 of our entire GNP on health care. That's going to be 730 or 740 billion dollars. Canada spends about eight and a half percent England about 6.5%, Germany about 7%, France about 7.5%, and, and so on. Uh, Japan about 5.5%. It puts us in a, at a great competitive disadvantage. If you take autos alone, when you buy an automobile now, at the low volume at which we're operating, so you can't spread out the cost, you're going to pay between $600 and $700 of the price of that car on health care. And Japan, it's been perhaps $200. So this is another issue that we must address. And in addition to spending the most money of any country in the world, we have 37 million of our fellow citizens who don't have any health care at all. And I tell you, the health delivery system in this country is in shambles. And that has to be addressed if we're going to enhance our competitive position. I believe that we have to take a more open view than we ever had before of saying that maybe our government should become more involved in the economic affairs of our nation like they do in other countries that are so successful. That maybe we should intervene in an intelligent and selective way. 
You know, the invisible hand of Adam Smith, that economic theory of the free marketplace, is a thing of the past. And that grand old Scott wouldn't know a computer chip if he stumbled over one. And then when you look at the trade policy, and the trade policy is born of Ricardo's theory of, of, the, uh, of the comparative advantage. But in this world, the government becomes an agent of the comparative advantage. They become the comparative advantage uh, by their very actions. And we have to, it seems to me, take a view that corresponds more closely with those countries at, with which we compete. And then we stand idly by all through the 80s where we see this massive accumulation of wealth to a few people on the top, where the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the middle class got on a slippery slope. And there's reams of statistics that make this point that you've all read about. But there's one this week that I thought sort of caps it. The Federal Reserve Board about Tuesday or Wednesday has said that the top 1% of the people of our nation, the top 1% have greater net worth, the 1% than the other 90, than not the bottom 90% in our country. And maybe, you know, it would be instructive if we looked at the last depression, the Great Depression of the 30s. And there, there was this massive accumulation of wealth uh, during the 20s. And then, of course, we had the collapse in 29. But in 1929, the top 5% of the people of this nation had 34% of the income. The top 1% had 19% of the income. And then came the New Deal and the Second World War. And we have a massive redistribution of that wealth. And by 1946, the top 5%, instead of having 34% of the wealth of the income, were down to 18%. And the top 1% went down from 19% by 1946 to 7.7%. And so then you had to a shift, a massive shift in purchasing power uh, to the middle class of our country. And then when you look at the period immediately following that, the rest of the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and 70s, and we had some bumps on the road, but still there were good times basically of, uh, of expanding economy and ever-increasing standard of living for the people of our nation. So the question is, is there a lesson here for the 1990s? Well, we still have to address the question of competition and many fronts. And we have to talk about efficiency, greater efficiency and greater productivity in our workforce. And I submit that we can do this best by working together, uh, labor and management, and in a whole variety of industries and in the public service in the United States, you see these joint endeavors. In auto and steel and other, you see joint health and safety committees. You have to see joint training committees when a significant amount of money is putting in a training fund and the union and management collectively with equal voice decide who's going to be trained for what jobs, what the budget is going to be for those training programs. And now we've even reached up in the health and safety, we have joint committees throughout the plants of, of the nation. And we now even have joint committees on quality. Uh, what shall the quality standards of the product be? And it used to be in auto that the companies used to say, that's none of your business. And as a managerial prerogative, we'll decide what the standard of quality is here. And we kept arguing that it's of deep concern to us because if you have poor quality, it's going to hurt us competitively. And if that happens, we're going to lose jobs. So now we are involved in the quality of the product. And then we're involved in a more complex labor management relationship, and it's called employee involvement or uh, employee uh, quality of work life programs. And just to try to describe it to you, what it means to me in simple terms is the employers of this nation, particularly the large ones, have found out what I knew 50 years ago 
that the men and women in the workplaces of America are intelligent, they've got a great deal of ingenuity and they're innovative, and if you give them the opportunity, they can make a contribution to your establishment. Now, the employer is motivated getting involved in this program of empowering the workers and giving them effective voice because it results in greater efficiency, it results in lower absenteeism, you put these things together and better quality, it results in greater productivity and efficiency. The unions, on the other hand, are motivated by the desire to democratize the workplace, where we want the workers to feel better about working. I want them to feel that they're making a contribution. Now, these relationships are, are fragile because they're dependent upon like other human relationships, or it be a marriage or a friendship, on mutual trust and mutual respect. And if either one side or the other loses that mutual trust or mutual respect, that program is, is in difficulty. It's not only auto and steel. I had the opportunity two or three years ago to discuss with the people from Northwest and Natural Gas the introduction of a labor management program there and talked to them about what was going on in auto, and I informed just today that the program is, as, uh, as I, I don't want to exaggerate, is a smashing success. The workers are involved in the decision-making process. The company is benefiting by their intelligence and their ingenuity and their innovativeness. Now, let me give you a, one example, perhaps in, in auto, and it's interesting in looking at the NUMI plant in Fremont, California, because there you're comparing apples and apples. And in that situation, when GM ran that plant, and I do not exaggerate, it's, it's a, astonishing, at 20% absenteeism, and obviously you can't build a quality car with that kind of absenteeism, you shuffle people around every day. And the quality was atrocious. And then when a NUMI was launched and the arrangement was me made between General Motors and Toyota, I was still president of the union. There's great reluctance, understandable reluctance, I suppose, of Toyota hiring in the old General Motors workforce. But eventually they did. So you had the same workforce. We had the same local leadership. They got reelected. And that local leadership not only had an adversarial relationship with, Amer uh, with General Motors, but a hostile relationship. And they bought into the new system. I was in that plant. It has. Uh, good technology, but not state-of-the-art. I've seen better plants in Japan, United States, in terms of technology. But what they've done, and the people tell me this, what is the difference? They say their intelligence is being respected, they're consulted on the way the job is being organized, they have an effective voice, and now the absenteeism rate is something like 3%, and they produce one of the best plants, uh, best cars uh, in this nation. Uh, one other that's worthy of looking at, and that is a Saturn plant in Springfield, Tennessee. Incidentally, in NUMI, there's no layoffs at all. Never has been any layoffs, and they're committed to a no layoff policy, except that some catastrophe should strike. In Saturn, they go a step further. It's a GM wholly owned subsidiary. The union was involved right from the outset in planning that plant. Uh, they even helped design the assembly line. Every assembly line in America or Japan or every place in the world, there's one exception in Sweden, you have the chain assembly line where workers in a stationary position and, and you do your task within that, within that workspace. In Saturn, they decided, the workers decided, convinced the management, we're going to build it by modules. They had a voice in this decision as who the suppliers are, the part suppliers. They had a voice in the decision of who the advertisers was going to be. They have a voice in every single decision. There are no layoffs under the terms of the agreement. I'll give you one small example of, of how you involve people. About four weeks ago, it was decided that Saturn couldn't meet the demand in the marketplace working 40 hours. So they wanted to increase the number of hours to 50 a week. And that's fairly oppressive in the automobile industry. I mean, it's difficult work. And so what they did, they called the, all the workforce together, discussed the issue, the need to work additional hours, took a vote by secret ballot, and 87% of the workers voted to go on the 50-hour week. It's really 
governs by consensus. It's really, I think, the ultimate in democratic uh, decision making. And I would hope that over time that Saturn would become a pattern for America. Let me just say something briefly about the Chrysler board. Uh, I think that was a constructive move. I think that adds uh, to this proposition of giving the workers an effective voice in their own future and their own destiny through a representative. And the labor movement in America has to come to the conclusion that it's not enough to play the role that they've always played in our society. You let the management make all of the decisions, and then you protest the decisions that you don't like. The workers have to be involved when those decisions are being debated and when those decisions are made, those decisions that affect their lives, like the closing of a plant, and hopefully that notion would proliferate. Now, the same principles that apply in private industry apply to the public sector. There's ongoing programs in many communities in this state of workers and the management at getting together and designing these cooperative programs where the workers have a more effective voice in the decision-making process. In the public sector, however, they're added, un added pressure because of the shortage of resources. Federal grants to states and local communities has declined by 36% in the last 10 years. And the solution that some people come to very, very quickly, well, let's privatize this work or let's outsource this work. There's been so many case studies that warn you against that, that so many times privatizing are not either cost effective nor are they efficient. And I think you have to find better solutions than that. And I really believe that we can become a more productive and efficient workforce if we commit ourselves to this concept of democratizing the workplace. Now, change is difficult, as we all know. Uh, people are comfortable with the status quo. Uh, but I used to tell the leadership of, of the UAW that while it's difficult to change institutions, including unions, that change must come. Because if you don't change with times and events, history is going to pass you by. And leadership has to develop the capacity and the courage it sometimes takes to change with times and events. When I talk about change, I remind that story of Machiavelli. He's on his deathbed. And his best friend came to him and he says, Machiavelli, he says, you only got a few hours to live. You better renounce Satan and all of his teachings. And Machiavelli croaked out, this is no time to make new enemies. <laughs> now, if I could take the liberty in the last couple of minutes to uh, tell you about uh, my concern about uh, our country. I've been a social critic uh, all of my life, uh, but I think we have a good nation, uh, sometimes a great country, nearly always a generous country. But I worry about our inability to come to grips with problems when problems arise. And we don't come to grips with problems really to their absolute crisis. And that concerns me. And sometimes it isn't that we don't know what the solutions are, we just lack the courage and the will uh, to make those changes. And the other thing that concerns me that I believe from my perspective, and I don't say that this applies every place in the nation, but a generalization, I think it's safe to say that our country has become less concerned, less caring, and less compassionate than it was, once was. And we seem to have adopted a doctrine of, of greed and selfishness and, and meism. But I don't join the critics who say, well, it's impossible to change things. People say, well, what's the problem, what's the point in getting involved in a political process? One person doesn't make any difference and the people are powerless and the media dictate to us who's going to be our office holders or the large companies are so powerful. And that's true. Media has great influence and companies have tremendous influence, but the people are the ones that make the decision in our society. And the greatest enemy of democracy is cynicism. People who lose faith in the democratic process, 
and who don't trust anymore. That's the danger uh, to democracy. You know, our founding fathers, they had this novel and radical idea, and that concept sort of was, uh, the king is not sovereign, only the people are sovereign. And they had the wisdom to put the ultimate power in the hands of the people. And if the people will only exercise that power, we'll begin to solve some of the problems facing our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Our first question today from board host Mary McWilliams. I'd like to follow up a bit more on your comment toward the end about our inability to come to grips with some of the great problems in the country um, before their crisis. And could you elaborate on what are the forces that kind of paralyze us and what kinds of things you think could change to make the, to enable us more? Well, the first absolute essential is people being involved, institutions and people being involved in the political life of our nation. You know, if people don't believe that they can make a change, then democracy can't work. And when you look at our figures, uh, part, voter participation is absolutely embarrassing. It's shameful. So I think the first thing is people's involvement. Don't let institutions make decisions for you. You make your own decision. I haven't seen the figures, that I'll see them next week, but I think I heard that in the latest uh, election in the United Kingdom, 78% of the citizens voted. You know, in a presidential year, uh, we're hovering around 50%, give or take a percentage point on either side of 50%. In, in other races, you go to 25 or 30%. So I think the first great necessity of changing things is people's involvement in the democratic process. And they've got to believe and they've got to have faith because if you don't have that, I don't know where this democracy is going to end. Uh, John Holloway, City Club member. I have a question about uh, General Motors. I would like to know what you, uh, what you see as the, the political reasons for the closing of Willow Run and the, uh, the continuation of Arlington assembly plant. Well, there, there is a no winner. Uh, because if you'd have saved Arlington, Will or you saved uh, Willow Run, Arlington would have went down. Uh, the basic problem is General Motors has too much capacity. Uh, they miscalculated what their share of the market was going to be. It's declined steadily to around 35%. They build, just off of the top of my head, uh, I could name, they build a, a new plant in Lake Orion and Hamtramck, Michigan, and Oklahoma City, and Sherwood, and Fort Wayne, Indiana, Wentzville, Missouri put all this new capacity on board. Ford has built, the last plant they built was in about 32 years ago. So you have a combination of shrinking market share, excess capacity, and something has to give. And if it's not going to be Arlington, it's going to be Willow Run. And if it's, if it's not Willow Run, it's going to be a plant in Hamtramck, Michigan. It has to shrink. Now, GM last year sold roughly two and a half million vehicles, cars and trucks. And it, while they're doing that, they lost seven billion one hundred million dollars. You know, it's mind boggling. Now, with seven and a half million sales, you should make two billion dollars. So something's wrong. And the most obvious thing is wrong when you're operating at 65 percent in nearly any industry, but particularly in auto, uh, it's a hopeless, hopeless situation. So that, that company has to contract. Uh, one added word I heard just this morning, I didn't even hear the source. Uh, it, the source was some newspaper story, either in the Times today or Wall Street Journal, where they're going to eliminate uh, one of the Pontiacs, one of the Olds, one of the Buicks. Leslie Hildula, Business and Labor Committee. You've given us a couple of stories of companies that have done a credible job of implementing quality management and practicing employee empowerment. And it also occurs to me that unions perhaps have a credibility problem in how they run themselves because of some stories you've heard in the last, I don't know how many years, about some stories of some corruption here or there or obstructionism to efficiency. 
And I thought that you might be in a good place to tell us about some of the reforms, perhaps, that unions are practicing on themselves. Uh, I don't know quite what you're driving at. If you want me to admit here uh, <laughs> that, that there's corruption and unethical practices in the labor movement, I'll readily agree with it. The pity is that there's one or two unions who are guilty of unethical, un, un, uh, immoral practices, and the whole labor movement gets painted with the same brush. I happen to belong to a union. We've had one case in 52 years at the top level, and that was committed while this individual was in the local union. So the labor movement shouldn't be painted with a broad brush. Now, if you want to use a broad brush, let's talk about the executive salaries of all the corporate leaders of America. Now, there you got a broad brush. That's a goddamn scandal and a shame. <laughs> we still on radio? <laughs> My question exactly, uh, Mark Hammer, City Club member. I wanted you to. Uh, I know you have more thoughts on that subject, and I'd like to hear uh, hear more. Uh, particularly, uh, Lee Iacocca is as a, a very public figure, and uh, his salaries are uh, are widely publicized. And uh, you, as a member of the board uh, of that organization for some time, uh, I'd be interested in uh, what role the boards have, and and can a board, for practical purposes, on a major corporation like General Motors or Chrysler, uh, make uh, policy adjustments at the organizational level that address that issue? And if not, uh, what is the answer? Who uh, who could take responsibility for changing the uh, the, the practices? Uh, first of all, it shows you how times change. If, if you would have asked me three weeks ago, is it possible for the development events in General Motors to occur, I would have said it's out of the question because the inside directors so dominate the outside directors. And the problem with boards is I was an exception because my whole life was spent in the auto industry. I had the advantage. I was the only person on that board that ever worked in an automobile plant. But the inside directors dominate the outside directors because they know more. They know more about the running of the business. And they're never challenged. I was the only one on the board that, that challenged them, uh, the inside directors. Now, that doesn't mean the outside directors are a bunch of uh, imbeciles. Hell, on the, on the Chrysler board when I was there, Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard, you know, extremely able, intelligent man. The president of Boeing, Chief Hallaby, who used to be a CEO of Pan Am. Uh, Paul Speck, the chairman of the board of Reynolds, you know, people of, of substance. But they couldn't challenge Iacocca and the inside directors and the workings of the company. And I can tell you, I was out here when it happened, I was absolutely shocked uh, when I read that the outside directors of the board evidently had a little caucus. They must have co copied this from unions. They got together and had a caucus and, and decided to move on the establishment. And I think that's a healthy development. Uh, I, I think, can think of many cases where the outside directors should have exercised the power that they're supposed to have. The difficulty, of course, is the establishment appoints these directors, so they're beholden to them. Now, uh, I guess what I read of what happens in GM here, you have people who just left the CEO of a company and they, they sort of exercise the authority that the outside directors always had. Thank goodness they did it. I think they were absolutely right in doing it, and they should do it more often. Contrast that with uh, in the 80s when things were going badly and people asked me, you know, things are going badly. Uh, isn't the board going to, you think they're going to remove Roger Smith? I said, never. They wouldn't even think of moving poor old Roger because uh, uh, they're so beholden to the inside directors. Hopefully a change is taking place and I think hope other boards and other outside directors exercise the authority that they have and the responsibility they have to remove those officials who are not performing and keeping faith with their stockholders. Hi, uh, Amy Kiter, City Club member. I'm the coordinator of an employee involvement system in a partially organized or uh, unionized organization. And I don't think that your call for change is filtering down to the unions that need to be active in this, in this change, in, in becoming involved. Also, I think that um, they're really floundering and foundering when it comes to how to participate in the move to continuous quality improvement. Can you give a little bit of I, I, insight I into that problem? I should, should have mentioned that, that the movement toward worker involvement uh, moves unevenly, even within companies. Uh, I can show you plants in GM who have a well-designed program 
and are getting tremendous results in Ford and Chrysler. I show you other plants that just have a mediocre program. The key is that both sides have to buy into it. And I can show you situations in General Motors where a single plant manager prevented the implementation of a meaningful program because he viewed this as a, an erosion of his authority, usually in the older generation, the older plant managers. On the other side of that coin, uh, you see uh, labor, local union leaders who wonder about this system. Is this an erosion of my authority at the, on, the work, on the work floor? So you have these two groups that resist. And it's a business that's change again. Uh, they, are, they are victims of, uh, of habit and prisoners of history, and you have to work at it. Uh, but I didn't want to leave the impression that there's some pattern out there and you just throw it out there and everybody follows it. It's hard work. It's hard work to get people to change habits many kinds. But once that decision is made, and once both sides buy into it, it can't be done on a paternalistic basis, it has to be voluntarily, it has to be a partnership. And I see my friends there from Northwest Natural Gas nodding his head, and he should probably be up here rather than me because he has a, a current example of how the system can work when both parties buy into it. But if both parties don't buy into it, it's not going to work. After about 40 years of uh, business activity in which I was employing groups that were unionized, uh, and having left about seven years ago, I am encouraged by what uh, you have to say about the uh, evolution of union activities. Uh, the thing that concerns me looking at the contenders for our political leadership is that nowhere uh, among the pronouncements have I seen any vision of, of an industrial policy which would reflect the kind of a situation you're talking about. Uh, is, is there anybody on the scene, even including Ross Perot, that you think could um, continue to develop this kind of a program? Um, first of all, I, I really don't know what Ross Perot's attitude on that question or 55 other questions when I think of it. Uh, the, the closest thing, I, I think the national debate is really just beginning on this whole, you know, industrial policy was really a bad word. But now people are writing about it, people are talking about it. Uh, Clinton, although I don't pretend to know exactly uh, where he's coming down on this question, he gave a speech the other day that comes close. Uh, however, I, sometimes I look at the politicians' advisors and who they are and make a judgment there. And I happen to know two of Clinton's people, uh, Bob Reich and Ira Magaziner, who have been writing and thinking about this. Bob Reich just wrote a book recently uh, who have been thinking about this. They're very thoughtful people, intelligent people, and that gives me encouragement. Uh, from the other side, I must say, and uh, I don't want to reveal my political prejudice, uh, <laughs> I, I never come wearing a suit of neutrality. I'm not a neutral. Uh, but but uh, on the other side, I think uh, Bush and his people really are, uh, they really should be living in the, in the era of Adam Smith and, and Ricardo. Uh, but but uh, I, I think it's evolving in our country. I really do. If you look at the national debate, industrials are speaking up, you know. It's not only uh, union people or Democrats. Uh, many industrialists are now uh, speaking and writing about industrial policy. Now, he's not the most popular man in the world anymore, but Iacocca just read a, uh, wrote a, a significant article on the need for industrial policy, and, uh, and I think he did it in a thoughtful way. Uh, he looked around the world and looked at what Japan was doing, looked at what Germany was doing, and how these other con com countries uh, intervene in a skillful, intelligent way to assist companies uh, that uh, otherwise would go by the board. Claudia Burnett, City Club member. I have a fear that the crisis of confidence between labor and management is of such a magnitude at this point that it virtually precludes effective cooperative action. Could you comment on that? Oh, no, no, no. I. 
you know, I, I can see the, uh, seen a worse situation, the most antagonistic uh, relationships uh, at the, particularly at the plant level overcome uh, those feelings and embark upon a program of cooperation. Now, uh, to be frank about it, I don't think this comes about all the time through an intellectual process, but it comes about as a result of adversity. And it's sort of the, the words of, of Franklin, either we will hang together or most assuredly we'll hang separately. But a lot of the change comes about uh, as a result of adversity. There's nothing wrong with that. Much change comes about as a result of it. No, but I, I would never give up. Hell, you might be reading next year that the Caterpillar and the UAW have embarked upon a brave new program. <laughs> Kathy Huddleston, City Club member. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you said you know, that employment was one of the biggest problems facing the country. And at the same time, just a little bit later, you said that GM had to close a plant because they have to become smaller. Um, what do you see as the replacement industries that are going to provide uh, for jobs in the, in the next 10 or 20 years? And, and what can we do to try to encourage that? Well, I, I think you have to develop broad national policies, and hopefully, uh, while GM uh, shrinks, somebody else, uh, uh, somebody else will will grow. Uh, but I don't think uh, one or two or three companies can do it alone. It gets back to the basic question that you have to have the leadership and the political political leadership in a nation to drive the country toward policies that lead to full employment and uh, that reduce unemployment and uh, a country that's innovative, has the most advanced technology, and is more competitive than other countries. But you really need a national policy uh, to, to accomplish that mission. Cheryl Warren, member. Could you comment on where you think the Caterpillar situation will end up and be resolved, and what part pattern bargaining is going to play in that situation? Well, pattern bargaining had a very important role because that was the whole issue in the strike. Uh, and that industry, historically, they've had pattern bargaining. Uh, sometimes Caterpillar established a pattern and it was followed by Deer. And if you go back just a few years, it meant International Harvester, JIK, Shellis Chalmers. Now those, a lot of those companies are gone. And so I guess the union fully expected that when he set the pattern in Deer, uh, Caterpillar would follow. Uh, Caterpillar had a, a different idea, and without getting into, into the merits, I, I must say that we've had pattern bargaining in the automobile industry ever since the, the union existed, but we've deviated when we had to. We deviated in Chrysler three different times when they were in difficulty. We deviated in American Motors when they were in difficulty, uh, but that wasn't the case in Caterpillar. Caterpillar never claimed inability to pay. Uh, they just said they'd be more competitive. Well. I suppose any company that uh, could reduce the wages would become more competitive, but that's a hell of a way to become more competitive on the back of the workers. So you had this absolute conflict. Uh, you know, the strike went on a terribly long time, five months. Uh, I was worried sick while I was out here because it looked the end was going to be, you know, permanent replacements. And the age cohort there is 45, 50. The average seniority is 23 years of age at 23 years seniority. And a lot of the workers in that plant, their children were just starting college, probably first generation. And all of these things were at stake, and it would have been a shattering. We shattered the life of all those people had they waited until permanent replacements were hired. And the union uh, made a very difficult decision, a courageous decision, but an absolutely correct decision in ending the strike. Now, I never fooled myself, it's not written in stone, that when you go out on strike, you win. You know, when you go on a strike, you ought to go in with your eyes open. You can win and you can lose. In this situation, uh, we didn't win. And it's no disgrace that people fought courageously and valiantly for what they thought was right for five long months. And thank goodness it's over. Steve Shell, member, um, you've made it <clears throat> a kind of frontal assault on the old economics, Adam Smith, Ricardo, and so forth. It's obvious to a number of people that that whole line of thinking leaves something to be desired. Uh, a guy named Etzioni has been talking about uh, communitarianism. I wonder if you've 
given any reflection to that set of ideas and can give us some insight as to what you see the new economics uh, uh, unfolding as and how that would affect the labor movement? Well, for, first of all, I'm not too sure, and I, I, I know this is sound partisan, you're not going to have a change unless you make a change in government. It's that simple. Uh, the Republican Party, for reasons best known to themselves, and if the people choose them to elect the nation, to lead the nation, we're going to continue, because they believe uh, fervently, uh, conviction, uh, both Reagan and Bush, that the free marketplace, the silent, invisible hand of Adam Smith will take care of everything. It's a non-interventionist policy. They made a couple of exceptions, uh, Reagan's year and Harley Davidson, they really saved that company by putting on tariffs and quotas. But other than those exceptions, uh, you, they are committed to the status quo. And if they are in power for another four years, you will not see us take steps down the road uh, to deviate from the past, the ancient past. And I'm fearful that while we travel that road, other countries are making adjustments. You've got the European community now. And to give you an example, the European community has a problem in terms of automobiles. Because while they were acting individually, uh, Great Britain restricted Japanese imports to 11%, uh, Germany about 12%, France 3%, and Italy, they don't want to start you know, changing numbers every year because of the percentage, 2,000 cars a year. So now, as the community comes together, they've got a deal and have a common front. And so they decided, and they just told the Japanese, this is what we're going to do, and you, you, you must comply. We're going to allow you to keep the same percentage of market you now have, 11%. But we'll let you grow to 16% between now and the year 2000. But the way you grow is you now import, or from Japan export, and the European community import, 1,300,000 cars a year. We're freezing you at that number until year 2000. But you can get this growth from 11% to 16% by putting some capital in the European community, building plants in the European community, and creating jobs in the European community. Now, while the European community is doing that, and we follow the policy of status quo, puts more pressure on the American market in terms of imports. But these are the things that are going on in the world, and we are captured by the status quo, and we're uh, victims of habit and, uh, and creatures of, of history. And, uh, and I think it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I don't see any change, unfortunately, uh, unless we make a fundamental change in government. Ted Kay, City Club member. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, hullabaloo about the idea of buy American and a lot of confusion about what is American in terms of content in cars and other products. Would you comment on that? Well, again, you wouldn't hear the cries of buy American. That also flows from insecurity and unemployment. If you think back when all the auto workers were working, we didn't care who bought what car. Everybody was working. Everybody was prosperous. But uh, the, the, what is American has been rooted about, and it's a simple uh, thing to determine if people would just give the public the facts. And I can tell you that Saturn comes close as a 100% American car. But I can tell you the basic GM, uh, Ford, and Chrysler cars that are built in the United States have anywhere from about 88% American content to about 90% American content. Now, when you get these hybrids, you know, uh, for example, the, the captives, the import captives of Ford GM, obviously they have a high percentage. Uh, when uh, you look at the cars that are uh, being built uh, in, uh, in a transplant plants, they have a very low percentage. But American cars, there's really no secret about it, they have very, very high American content. And what people do is they count the p cars that we import, the captives that we import, and then they sort of average it out, then you get the lower percentage. But I can assure you, if you buy the traditional uh, Ford GM Chrysler car, you're buying a car of very high American kind. Now, it was, well, there was a time, I take, for example, Chrysler, uh, it didn't have any four-cylinder engines, so Mitsubishi made them. And then they didn't have the sixes for the van. 
And again, Mitsubishi uh, made the engines. But now we have an engine plant in a place called Trenton, Michigan. We're building all the engines domestically. So the American cars have extremely high American content. Uh, I should make one other exception. Uh, I think it's a continental. In order, it gets complicated. In order to meet the fuel efficiency requirements, uh, is importing uh, the engine from Mexico. Ray Bolani, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. Fraser, uh, in March of 1989, uh, in this state, we registered the same number of vehicles as we had people. Um, as someone who spent his life in, in the automobile industry, what do you think is the future? Can we continue to expand? I, uh, it's not quite that bad. Uh, trying to think now. Yeah, I think there's 166 million cars and about 50 million trucks and what 250 million people. Uh, I, uh, we've always been uh, our union uh, for mass trans transportation, uh, although it has some impact out of, on the auto industry. Although I think people argue this wrong, because unless people can move about, and if these highways get so clogged up and parking gets so expensive, people will stop buying cars. Take New York City, we probably have the lowest per capita ownership there than uh, any, any place in the country. So I really believe the auto industry in its own self-interest should be concerned about some form of mass transit uh, to supplement uh, the, the automobile. Uh, I must say, the American people really are in love with the, with the automobile more than any other peoples of the world. And it's uh, maybe our individuality. Uh, you try to arrange, I can remember one, during one of the, uh, the gas, uh, gasoline embargoes, I went out to the University of Michigan, a professor there had any, on a computer matched the, the auto workers by neighborhood. And we said, we're going to share the ride, you know, and save fuel and so forth. We couldn't get anybody in any car. Everybody wanted to go their own ways. It's very individualistic. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, Felipe Gonzalez, who's been prime minister of Spain for, I don't know, six, seven years now, had never been to this country. And uh, Winnie, my wife, and I were over at Spain. We visited with him. He's not a, he was a member of parliament. And he wanted to come to the United States. He didn't want to come under the auspices of the AFL-CIO or that he didn't want to come under the auspices of the United States government. So we invited him over, and I arranged meetings with him with the executive branch, with Mondale and, and Carter, but he also wanted to meet with a Ford Motor Company, and he wanted to talk to them about building a plant in Spain, and then he wanted to meet with Chrysler, same thing. So I took him out to Ford's, and uh, he met with the officials there. Uh, Henry was, was CEO, and he dropped in for a couple of minutes, but didn't participate in the meeting, and Gonzalez made in the pitch. Then I took him to Chrysler's, opposite side of town, all highways. And so we're gonna cross the highway, and he says to me, he says, you know, you know, you have uh, no mass transportation system in this country. I says, yeah, I says, it's the automobile. He says, it's, there's only one person in every car. <laughs> and just then, I was ready to pull off the expressway in Highland Park, where the Chrysler headquarters are located, and there's, we see a bus. And as I go up the ramp, we look in the bus, only the driver is in the bus. <laughs> <laughs> But, but there, we've tried time and time again, and, and uh, you know, I look at other countries, and maybe they're more, more tolerant of traffic jams than, than uh, we are, they, but they've got wonderful transportation systems. I don't know if anybody's been in Japan, and, and you land in Narita Airport, and it would take you two and a half hours to get into Tokyo. Uh, but but I, I'm for mass transit. I hope we can, uh, it's one of the things that we could do, I think, if we were imagining if, if and if the government put enough money and resources and we needed some research and development, and I think it would serve the country well if we had a decent mass transit system. This has been marvelous. I wish we could go on and on and on, Mr. Fraser. It's been wonderful having you with us as we adjourn. Let us once again thank Douglas Fraser, former president of the United States.